put it back in the, uh, the movement holder. Now the next stage, um, which is the final kind of process, is we're going to lubricate the pallets and fit them. So these are the pallets. Now lubrication with pallets uh, does vary from movement uh, to movement. Uh, the one thing you don't lubricate on almost any watch is the, the pallet uh, jewels in the plates and in the cock. Because the pallet moves in a very small arc, about 10 degrees from left to right, uh, there is no need to add lubrication uh, to this jewel or the cock jewel uh, because in fact you're only actually more likely to increase drag uh, than actually help uh, the watch. So you don't need to add lubrication to these jewels um, it's entirely not, not necessary. On most Swiss uh, movements you only lubricate the entry stone on the pallets um, but on some movements uh, the pallets require some lubrication on both st uh, both stones uh, but for this movement uh, you would only apply a very minute amount of lubricant on the entry stone and the lubrication that you should use is uh, Mobius 941 uh, it comes in liquid and grease form uh, the grease is slightly easier to use and uh, you would apply a very small amount but again this kind of um, detail is something that I'm going to go over in later videos uh, in terms of lubrication So for the purpose of this video, I'm going to lubricate the entry stone. Some people like to lubricate the entry stone uh, once the pallets are in place. I like to lubricate the entry stone uh, beforehand as it's easier and clearer to see. Um, than it is once it is fitted in the movement. So now we're going to fit the pallets and we're going to take the pallet cock and again this is an area where you really want to take your time you don't want to uh, damage the pallet uh, staff pivots. So you can get the cock in its general position like so. And then again you take your piece of pegwood and you want to apply a very light pressure on the cock. Let's help in the shape of the pegwood is correct. So you want to apply a very light pressure to the cock as you position the upper pallet pivot. So I think that's on in position now, just going to check with the loop. So the pallets are out now in position, but we're going to keep pressure on with the pegwood as we fit the screws when they're not pinging off. So again, we're going to tighten the screws down until they just about grip. I'm not going to tighten them down fully because if you tighten them down fully uh, before the pivots are in place you are quite likely to snap them pivots off and you'll end up having to try and locate a new part so the screws in the pallet cock there are just snug down only just and what we can do now is we can wind the movement a few turns and if the pallets are correctly in position you should be able to snap them from one side to the other uh, using the transmission of force through the train wheels so as we can see there it wants to snap left and right so we know that the pallets have uh, free movement so they're fine so we can tighten those screws down and the very last component to be fitted is the balance if I can get this little cock screw 
is hiding from me. There we go. So when you're fitting the balance, there's a roller jewel, which I'll try and show you. There is a roller jewel on the underside and you want to align this roller jewel uh, with the center of the fork at the end of the pallets. Not sure if you're really gonna see that. So we're gonna flip the balance over. Use the loop. And again, this is something that you really want to take your um, your time with because you don't want to damage the pivots on the balance. Use a piece of pegwood to get the, uh, the balance cock down. And as you can see, the uh, the movement is already swinging into action. And we can uh, tighten down the balance. And uh, there we pretty much have it. Is uh, the movement is assembled now and is. Uh, is ticking away. That's only after a few winds, so the amplitude is going to be a little low on a few winds. So the final stage is to lubricate the uh, the train wheel jewels, and um, it's quite surprising when you're lubricating uh, watch movements how little lubrication uh, you need. Some people will have a tendency to over lubricate, and this can cause other issues, which I'm not going to go into because there's lots of uh, detailed information when it comes to lubrication: too much, too little, and uh, things like that. So the lubrication uh, oilers that I like to use, I use two different types of uh, oiler. I use this uh, this red one, which is a really, really super fine and something that I would use on the pallet stones. And then I have this um, medium uh, sized oiler, uh, which can be used for pretty much most things, but you can get them in all different uh, sizes. This, this is a very large oiler, which I use for uh, a whole variety of different things. The types of lubrication uh, that you use will vary from movement to movement and again you do have to check the manufacturer's tech sheets for what kind of lubrication they use um, and perhaps I'll tr try and do a video on uh, some of the general lubrications that you, lubricants uh, that you can use on most movements uh, because it can vary from movement to movement. Something like a Rolex can require between seven and nine different types of lubricant uh, and other movements only require two or three. So, and uh, luckily they're, they're not purposely color coded, that just happens to be the, uh, the color of the lubricants. So we're gonna start off with the center wheel and we're gonna use a touch of uh, D5 lubrication. Uh, D5 being a slightly thicker oil and the arbor of the center wheel is uh, quite large. So we're gonna use a loop here. And just let the oil seep into the oil cup, which is difficult to do again from the distance. And then for the other train wheels uh, we're going to clean the oil up and use some Mobius 9010. A very tiny amount for the uh, the escape wheel, and then we can flip it over and do the same on the other side. Now 
Now the lubrication for the other wheel we already did prior to fitting the, the, uh, the minute wheel so we don't need to uh, worry about that. And that is the, uh, the movement uh, pretty much uh, ready to go. I mean that's the basics of it. It is a little bit crude how I've done it in the video. Uh, it does require a certain level, a bit more precision, but you're going to get the general idea of uh, how to do it and where. So we can wind the movement up fully, which is in preparation for the next video. We're going to be looking at uh, the timing, how to adjust the timing, and things like that. So the movement's now fully wound. And we can check uh, on this side that everything's working. We uh, fit the hour wheel. And we can see that that's all working as well. Although that setting lever is a little loose. So there we have it, that's how we reassemble and basically lubricate uh, the movement. Now I did forget actually to lubricate the other side of the, uh, the center wheel, so that's not deliberate, that is just um, forgetting for the purposes of this video. Uh, however, I'm as new to video making as, uh, as almost anyone else. But hopefully you get a general idea of how to reassemble uh, this movement. And uh, the lubrication side, the mainspring and the balance jewels are something that I'm gonna go over in separate videos where it's easier for me to explain, uh, possibly using photo format. But hopefully this video has proven uh, helpful. Uh, in the next video, we're gonna go over um, the, uh, the timing aspects, how you check the timing of the movement to make sure everything's right and uh, how to use the time grapher to see uh, if the timing's okay. So that'll be in the next video. And then the final video uh, will be the reassembly of the, the dial, the hands, the casing, and everything uh, once that's all done. But hopefully you liked this video and it wasn't too long. And um, I'll see you in the next video. So until then, take care.